Welcome to AMP. My name is Richard Conway and this is the platform for age group multi-sport athletes to showcase their journeys. To episode 43 and it's been a fortnight as usual um, since we did our last interview our last recording and um, hope everything's going all right in your training and your preparation for the season ahead on this episode we've got an age group triathlete who's actually in my age group I uh, didn't realize at the time and it's an age grouper from my neck of the woods. He's living up in Ripon. Uh, so that's actually a stone's throw away from where I was born in Stockton on Tees. It's nice to hear somebody with a familiar accent. That guy is James Lee. James has been doing multi sport and triathlon in particular since the late 80s when him and his pals. Um, heard about one that was taking place near to them and they thought, hmm, let's have a go. So they did. They cobbled some gear together and took part and um, they got the bug. And since then, James has been doing a mixture of triathlons and duathlons interspersed with fell running in the winter and... Um, lots of marathons all over the world um, so it wasn't until he was approaching 50 that um, he decided that he would have a go for age group and so he looked at what was required and figured out what he needed to do and lo and behold he qualified so that's fantastic and uh, so he tells us about his journey what he used to do and um, the differences between back in the 80s. I mean, God, what's that? 80s, 90, 2000s. Two, that's, that's 40 years ago. Wow. That's a long, long time, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, that's coming up. Hope you enjoy that. Uh, really enjoy chatting to James. Lovely chat. Our lifestyle hack on this episode is quitting dairy. Um, and I'll be chatting about that. I've not touched dairy for... Mm, two and a half, three years now um, and I'll go into the reasons of, of why that was and how I feel um, since I've not not been eating dairy um, so that's coming up uh, what have we been doing the last couple of weeks well, it's not been the greatest of times if I'm being honest uh, even though we're in the middle of January and the weather hasn't been too bad it's been pretty fair uh, a little bit cold and frosty. Um, I went out for a long run last week. And it was the longest I'd done. And I went over the walls, which is like a hilly, undulating part of Lincolnshire. And um, I'd planned on getting to... There's like a top road called the Bluestone Heath. And I'd planned on getting to that. And then turning back and retracing my steps... And it was going to be about 17k, something like that. Longest one I'd done for a while. And got to Bluestone Heath, turned round on my way back. All this is in zone two, by the way. Um, and I felt my right calf tighten. So struggled on, struggled on, and um, I've rested it ever since. So... It wasn't the one I'd originally injured, it was the opposite one. So, not sure whether I've pushed it too far too soon, probably. Uh, did I warm up correctly? Not sure. So, anyway, been resting it, icing it, uh, heat, stretching. Um, yeah, just trying to cajole it back into life. It's, it's pretty good now. Uh, at the recording of this, it's not too bad. I'm going to try and go and have a run later on this week and see how it fares. So that was the first setback, and then I got onto the turbo. Um, 
FTP test. It was worse. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, just legs didn't have it. Um, so that was a bit of a bit of a downer as well. But we're in January and we can't expect miracles, especially after a, a period of injury. So we've just got to keep going and consistency's um, there. So we've just got to keep building and hopefully strength will come back and we'll be able to run and, and uh, everything will turn out all right. So it's so not the greatest of times at the moment, if I'm being honest. Uh, been listening to a couple of new podcasts. Uh, first one was Try Dot podcast, and um, they were talking about running shoes, uh, which was quite interesting. So, if you're in the market for a new pair of running shoes, head over there to Try Dot and um, have a listen to to that episode. It was a recent episode, and they had a couple who run a, a blog and a website about testing kit basically and they're called Believe in the Run and they just go out and test all these different pieces of kit and they were testing uh, running shoes and they were talking about them so have a listen, see what you think, I enjoyed it and another one that I found, um, somebody mentioned it on uh, Instagram and it is called Triathlon Mockery um, which I thought was a fantastic name and it's two uh, professional triathletes, Joe Skipper, who I'm sure you've heard of, if you're into the long distance um, scene. He's been ranked up there for quite a few years now, um, amongst the amongst the, the best in the world. And Tom, I'm going to butcher his surname, Tom Ustik. Um, very funny. And uh, they talk all things triathlon and some things that are not. Uh, in the last episode that I listened to, they were talking about Joe's fear of um, staying in the sauna. Uh, and he, he was having to build himself up to stay in longer and longer. And it became a battle. And he thought to himself, if he couldn't stay in the sauna longer than anybody else... I how is he going to do a, an Ironman distance? Um, so that was quite a, a funny funny podcast. So give them them guys a listen. Um, really good. And then I come across um, an interview with Ali Brownlee. And he was talking about the sub-8 and the sub-7. Uh, and it was his idea. And I didn't even realise that. I'd heard about it. I'd heard uh, Christian Blumenthal has got his part of it with Alistair. And those are the two guys who are going to go and do the sub-7 uh, but I didn't realise that it was Ali's idea in the beginning. And he just wanted to, um, pretty much what he said was he wanted to do a uh, like a Netflix movie about it, documentary about it, um, to show what something like that would entail. And he got the idea from um, when Chip Chogi went uh, sub two and how they'd put that together. And that's what Ali wanted to do. He wanted to get some interest into triathlon. And he thought this would be a really good way of doing it. So, But there's him, Christian Blumenthal, for the men going sub-7. And there's uh, Lucy Charles Barkley and Nicholas Spirig, um, who are doing the, the sub-8 for the, for the ladies. So that'll be really cool. They're sort of using the rules of a, the long distance, but moulding them into what they think they'll be able to use to break seven and eight hours it was a really interesting interview that he was on and backed by the phoenix foundation project it's a which is a non-profit organization created by polish businessman sebastian and i'm going to butcher his name as well here kul kulzik um, with the sole purpose of promoting physical activity as a way to improve health and well-being among children with particular focus on those in disadvantaged situations. So it, it should be it should be really good. Um, really looking forward to the more footage that they put out um, to see how they're going. And from what I believe and what I've heard and read is that um, they're going to be a group for each. I think they're each allowed 10 10 athletes to help them 
Um, so some on the swim, some on the bike and some on the run. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see between each of the athletes how they split it up and how they use and who, who they use um, as athletes. And Alistair was going on about um, what technology that um, they were going to try and implement also, for example, the best um, wetsuit that they could use, the fastest wetsuit they could use. And the same for the, for the skin suit on the bike. Um, to make it more aerodynamic. So yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of this and what filters down and if they actually do it. Um, and to bear in mind that Christian has already gone seven and seven and twenty, so he's not a million miles off it. To be fair, although the record uh, didn't stand for whatever reason. But um, yeah, so that's uh, keep your eye out for that. That'll be good fun to watch. Hopefully they'll do. He'll do a Netflix-style um, documentary on it and uh, we'll be able to see what goes on. And the final thing um, that I wanted to talk about was that um, when I was out for a meal with my good lady celebrating our anniversary um, just before Christmas, um, we were just chatting about the podcast and she came up with a fantastic idea about getting a couple of athletes... Um, who do multi-sport on the pod each episode and get them to chat about uh, them trying to qualify for age group. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the feelers out um, and try and get two age group wannabes um, that haven't qualified to represent their country already to come onto the podcast each episode and just let us know how they're getting on. It's going to be sort of like a, a diary of um, them getting to the qualification race. Um, so if you're interested in um, qualifying to um, basically represent your country or you know somebody who is about to set off on that journey, give them a shout or get in touch yourself and we have a chat and see uh, see where we go from there. So that's quite an exciting side topic. Um, it won't... It'll just run alongside the usual bits and bobs that we have on the podcast and, um, yeah, I think it'll be a really good addition. So well done, Mrs C, for coming up with that idea. I love it. Um, and that's about it for now. So here's the main event and we shall see you on the other side. Right. We've tried to negotiate the television volume level. <laughs> All good. Okay. Hello. Hello. And welcome along to AMP. And thank you very much for agreeing to, to come on and share your story. Much okay. appreciated. Um, I believe you're in North Yorkshire. Whereabouts are you? Yeah, I'm in Ripon. Oh, Ripon. Lovely. Lovely part yeah. of the world. Yeah, yeah very nice. Are you uh, born and bred up there? Uh, nearby, yeah, North Allerton. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. well, I was from Stockton. Yes, I picked up on your accent when I first yeah. started listening, and yeah. uh, um, I picked up on that, yeah. Oh, you got a guitar in the background as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's more of a, at the moment, it's just more of a, an ornament than anything else. <laughs> right, do you play? Not very well. I, I just strum and know a few chords, that's it. What about you? Yeah, I work in a band. I've been in a band oh, for right. about eight, 18 years. Um, oh, nice. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Play, the, play the bass in a band, but I've got a few guitars as well. Yeah, what uh, sort of music do you do? Uh, Maud R&B, The Jam, The Who, The Kinks, The Stones. Nice. Uh, kind of semi-professional working band. Pubs, clubs, weddings, yeah. that kind of thing. Cool. Very yeah. good. Yeah. So you were uh, been doing multi-sport for a considerable amount of, amount of time then? Yeah, well, um, started in the uh, late 80s. Right. Um, I'd done a little bit at school. Football was the main thing um, um, and a bit of running, but nothing much. Uh, finished football at 22 
um, did a bit of training with uh, a professional club as a non-contract with the reserves um, and then met a good pal, Tim Adams, at college and do, he put us into a triathlon in the late 80s at Ripon. Didn't know what we were doing, mm. didn't have a wetsuit, got a bit of hypothermia, uh, very undertrained, um, and then really settled down um, for a period of travelling around the world with him on bicycles from time to time, doing a bit of studying, uh, triathlon in the summers and uh, fell running in winter. Yeah. Um, so I'm a member of the Fell Runners Association and that was the cycle for a lot of years as we uh, raised family and uh, kind of got into it that way. Yeah, there must have been cause much, much going on at that point because it must have been fairly new, was it? Triathlon at that? Yes, in the late 80s, there was a handful of events in the north and yeah. you recognised most of the people um, and it was it was pretty basic, pretty authentic looking back now. Mm. Um, uh, but but very enjoyable and and um, it was it was a good 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 hobby to start and 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 kind of develop from. Yeah, so you must see a massive change now from where when you started because I don't suppose there's been many people have pretty much started when it the sport took off in the first place. No, there probably isn't, and obviously the technology has moved on mm. and. Um, the training and, and such forth but uh, the distances and the courses are basically the same um, and uh, the um, the attitude to, to the people in, in terms of friendliness and and the challenge against yourself and with your pals is a similar dynamic um, but in other aspects it's not recognizable in terms of um, children's uh, triathlon both my children have been involved in triathlon since they were eight years old Right. That's been a, lo a lovely kind of component to uh, our family life with the children doing triathlon. My daughter went through from eight to 16 and is qualified as a triathlon coach at 16 years old. Excellent. And is now coaching, coaching the children that she was in a club in. Mm. Uh, and my son um, was very competitive and got to the Yorkshire Talent Squad for a couple of years and trained down at the Brownlee Centre at Leeds. Yeah. Um, and weekends were spent going to take the children to different races around Yorkshire. Um, so the children's children's scene has certainly developed from yeah. from nothing in the in the late eighties. Yeah, and that must be really nice because um, as a parent, my son was into football. So I didn't. We didn't do anything other than, and football Saturday Sundays. You know, we didn't have time to do anything ourselves. So we were relatively latecomers to the multi-sport um, scene, if you like. Um, so that must have been quite satisfying for you to to have have your two children involved with you, and you could like guide them through it. And you know, having been in it so long yourself, it must have been quite rewarding to do to do it as a family. Very rewarding. Um, equally, my boy plays football Saturdays and Sundays as well. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just um, being healthy. And when we've gone on holidays um, to America or Cape Town, they've done 5K races when we're away on a holiday. We'll mm -hmm. go to swimming pools on holiday. And uh, so we've we've always combined it with, with how we are as a family, really. Yeah. And does your wife partake? Team manager. <laughs> um, so yeah, pulls it pulls it all together and facilitates. How she and support. how she stayed out of it for so long? That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I think administrator and team manager is a role. In, every team needs someone to do all those things. Yeah, very good, very good. I guess it's still a family concern, though, isn't it? Because she's she's probably looking after you all, and and you know. Indeed, indeed, it takes everyone's got their own role within it. Yes, yeah. yeah. I found it, Mark, because my son, when he finished playing football, he started triathlon as well. And my wife, she does triathlon. I was that focused on everybody else and getting all the gear and everything ready that I couldn't really concentrate on myself, if that makes sense. I was that worried about them and how they were going to do and, you know, whether they're going to be safe and did they have all the equipment with the bikes all right, that I just, in the end, I just said, look, we can't all race together. I said, it's doing my head in. How did you cope with that? Did you race with them or? Well, for some of the fell races, yes, that yeah. would be really chaotic um, because they'd leave the number in the pub from registration. The shoes would be left in the car. 
you'd be running around. Your warm up was basically running about after them, trying to get them <laughs> organised. Um, and I, I can recall running back to the car for my for my son's fell shoes and actually tying them on his feet on the start line um, when the adults and children were going off together. Mm. Um, in what and, and he'd left his number behind as well, so we had to rewrite his number out and pin it on his chest as the uh, safety briefing was taking place. And I think any parent who supported the children, especially young children, into a transition area, you're very helpless when you see them running around looking forlornly for their bike or yeah. setting off out um, with the goggles still on the head or something like that. But once they've done it so often, they uh, it was a good a good um, independence opportunity to develop yeah. their independence a little bit and learn some good skills that are transferable in life generally. So. But you were always counting the bike laps or the swim laps and trying to help them navigate the whole thing. Mm. Uh, so, yes, it, it was far from a relaxing afternoon, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So did you have you raced with them in the same triathlons then? Uh, we've trained a bit together. Um, yeah. They became a better swimmer than me by their, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. They yeah. were moving through the water far better than me. Um, and then we'd run around at Park Run at Fountains Abbey near Ripon. We were mm. regular park runners there. Um, and then, of course, their, their events were, were much shorter than mine. Um, occasionally, the fell race would chair the same course for part of it, and then the children would pair off and, yeah. and do a shorter loop. Um, so occasionally, you'd run side by side in a fell race or such forth. But uh, So some shared experiences, and much yeah. of the time was just supporting them. Yeah, cool. Really good. Yeah, it must have been really nice. Um, I know I did a couple of triathlons. My son was older when he got into it. He was 18, so I did a couple of triathlons with him and uh, duathlons and things, and that was that was pretty good. Uh, it's just nice to be able to do something together, and we still have the same interests, so that's... Although he's not doing it at the moment. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite rewarding, like we said earlier. So. And if, if one of the highlights for me was I used to drive my daughter and uh, onto the training area at the race course, Ripon race course, and mm. she'd sit on my lap and steer the car. And then she and my son would have the training session and then we'd drive home and get some chips on the way home. And then she passed a driving test. She qualified as a coach, a triathlon coach, passed a driving test in lockdown. And then when uh, we started coaching side by side, because I'd done my coaching qualifications at the same time as her to support mm. her, um, she drove me onto the course uh, to coach the children um, and then we coached side by side and yeah. that that journey had been a uh, metaphorical journey had been wonderful uh, yeah. for her and I to do that side by side and to coach together was mm. a, another lovely dynamic of our triathlon experience yeah so you're still coaching now then yes yeah, yeah. and what, what's the coach. club that you're in uh, NYP, so they're in NYP TriStars. It's uh, okay. it was North Yorkshire Police. It's now North Yorkshire People. So it's it's ah, a Ripon based okay. club at Ripon Race yeah. Course. I've so seen, it's lake yeah, I've club. I've seen the uh, the triathlon because I've done um, the Stokesley duathlon a few times when it was when it was on. I think that was one of the first things that I'd, I'd actually done in multisport actually. Um, so yeah, I, rec I remember seeing seeing the guys around in the in the suits yeah and it, it puts a good race on every year there's a weekend festival of triathlon down at the race course once a year and it was at one point the biggest club try in the country right um so um we've developed that over the years into a really good experience yeah so it's a big club then that you're in i think there's about 150 members um and we swim outdoors um when when the water's warm enough kind of yeah. spring to autumn put one race on a year and some duathlons midweek once a month and uh various training opportunities mm -hmm. so it's uh yeah yeah cool so how did you find out uh, about age group was there already age groupers in your in your club well i had an awareness of it because i've seen the suits around over the years yeah. um but my approach had always been um fell in winter uh fell in mountain running in winters triathlons in summer Mm -hmm. And then for about the last 10 years, um, I'd been doing marathons abroad every autumn as well, just uh, right. with another friend, um, Matt Dolan, just enjoying it. And it was all participation for me. It wasn't about performance. And then I was 54 years ago and mm -hmm. we went to Cape Town and I did an ultra marathon, the Two Oceans Ultra. Right. 
and um, the children did a, a 5k against, they'd never raced against other children in bare feet before. So it was a really interesting experience, Cape Town. We had a wonderful holiday, but I knew I couldn't go any longer distance wise than uh, 35 miles. That was mm. far enough for me. And I don't have the tra training opportunities to do much more than that. So I thought I would try something really short and go performance led and try for a GB qualification. And I knew swimming wasn't going to be good enough so um, duathlon was the obvious thing and sprint duathlon so it was very strategic which was yeah. a complete change from the last 30 years which would just be have a go at 30 40 events a year any any event would do mm -hmm. just to enjoy them um so I, I just had a project to train as short and sharp as i could from a performance basis to see if i could make the qualifying time yeah yeah. And that was the, the process, was the whole thing, really. I didn't expect to get selected. Mm. Uh, made the qualifying time and um, stopped at that and didn't expect to be selected. And when the email came through of selection, it was an enormous thrill. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing like it, is there? It was terrific. It mm. was a terrific thrill. And uh, the whole family went and we went out uh, in 2019 to Romania. Uh, I'd had a wonderful time. Yeah. Um, loved having the GB tracksuit, loved seeing other people in the tracksuits and being part of a team. Um, and just thought that it goes alongside some of the other great sporting memories that you have over the years, from your Ironmans to your ultra marathons. Um, it was just a terrific experience. Yeah. And following on from that, I bumped into a, a pal that I'd raced in the late 80s against, and we were very close in performance then, uh, Ian Wallace. And um, I suggested to him he try as well. And so um, subsequently, we both qualified for Spain um, just before lockdown, again right. in the Europeans, um, and went out to that and had a wonderful time and had made a few friends at this point as well. Um, so really enjoyed that one. Um, and then lockdown came and duathlon suits lockdown in a sense because you can bike and run without any other facilities. Mm. Um, I've got a treadmill in the garage. I've got a, a turbo in the garage. So you can be self-sufficient. And that's one of the attractions of the sport for me is that what you are able to put into it, you can get back out of it. You're not reliant on anyone else. Yeah. Um, so we qualified again, Ian and I, and recently went out to Spain again for the world championships. In a veil. Uh, Yes, just came yeah. back four weeks ago from that. Yeah. Met some wonder, other wonderful lads uh, and had a great time over there. Um, and um, to have qualified and represented at world and European level, it's been an absolute thrill. Yeah. Um, and um, I feel very fortunate. Yeah. I think going back to, you know, you looked at it and you, you actually went through the process of basically using your strengths, what you were good at, you know, and that is the way to do it. It is quite strategic, isn't it, in a way, to, to see, you know, what, what you need to, where you need to be and if it's, and what you need to work on. I mean, even at your strong events, like you're running and you're biking, you, you might not be up there and you might have to tweak it to get there, but it's doable, isn't it? It's definitely dwelling. I mean, you proved it and I proved it, it's doable, so. And I think... I've slightly overachieved to make it. It's always a roll down place for me. Yeah. And it's only by being completely strategic. And mm. I've enjoyed the change of that because for 30 years, I was very generalized with it. And I'd go from a bit of fell running to do a triathlon to a few weeks for marathon training, then go and do a marathon abroad and then slip back into the fell races, straight back into the tri season. Yeah. So everything was compromised, but because I loved doing them all, I was happy with that, mm. but I've really enjoyed the last few years just becoming really targeted and really focused yeah. to have a, a period of just trying to achieve this above all else mm. um, for now. And the experiences and the people that I've met um, have, have justified it. And it's been a, a wonderful Indian summer to my sporting career in a sense, because I've been going over 30 years. Yeah. This is a lovely chapter in that story. Um, and we'd probably title it the performance GB years. Um, <laughs> I like it. And yeah, it, it's been a really lovely, lovely additional dynamic. Yeah, yeah, that's, 
Yeah, I mean, there isn't anything like it, like you mentioned about the suit and I mean the 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 qualification that you got through, and then and then you you get your suit and all your gear and that comes and that's really nice. And you can involve all your family as well. I was at Taku Muir's as well, and I I took both my sons and their girlfriends, so there were six of us over there, and we made a holiday out of it, like we usually do. And it was it's just fab, you know, and they can actually be there and support you and be proud. And, you know, it's it's just such a nice thing, isn't it? Oh, it's wonderful. And my son and I have trained together and he's got a, a GB suit through the talent squad with the Yorkshire mm. region on it. And I've got my GB suit and to train side by side yeah. is an additional thrill, like coaching alongside my daughter, training alongside him. Yeah. Uh, our memories that I will hold forever. Absolutely, um, and and as a triathlete of over thirty years, it's it's been a wonderful thrill. Yeah, brilliant. Well, congratulations on all uh, that you've done so far. I'm I'm sure there's going to be many 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 more years because once you get that bug, you don't want to let it up. Because um, it's not easy qualifying every year. Um, it takes it takes some doing, doesn't it? It does. I, I have an expression that we're in the years of managed decline. Mm. So there's a lot of kind of prehab and a lot of rehab to, yeah. that goes on to just keep the body working. And whether I can sustain this performance level indefinitely, um, we shall have to see. Mm. Um, there's always something to manage and something to recover from. So um, if, if it all comes to an end and I have to settle back down to, to just um, pottering around the fell races or the park runs, or um, I've got one more marathon to complete the majors. Mm. So um, around the world, there's a few other targets that might come back into play after this. Yeah. But um, for as long as this can be sustained and the people that you can meet through it um, and the experiences, I think will stay with us forever. So it's well worth chasing whilst it's an option. Yeah, 100%, 100%. So what's been your favourite memory from that, this period that you've you've just described so far? I think the email of selection dropping in yeah. was um, a snapshot moment that I'll always remember the feeling when that landed. Mm. Yeah. And yet, you know, you, you said, oh, it's, it's only a roll down place. Makes no difference. There's only four people qualify outright. So, you know, and they're taking 20 in each age group. So you shouldn't, shouldn't you know, disregard that as not being as good because it is. You've still had to get that percentage to be able to go on. So, you know, it's, it's a fantastic achievement, really is. So what hints and tips would you have for new new people want to get into multi-sport? Um, and then also people that are in multi-sport but would like to go for age group qualification? I think for new people, and as a level one coach, I would encourage new people not to um, take on the expectations of others, but to find their own way, but consult with others and take the guidance from them, um, but work it out for themselves. Work out what works for them, not what works for everyone else, but be open to suggestions and such forth, but find their own way. Um, and uh, I think for people who are already competing at a decent standard who might be thinking of going for this, it's be strategic and have a plan. Mm. Um, and that can be the, the marginal gains of uh, adapting a number of things when put together will give you quite a significant return potentially. Um, so it's about being realistic with how much training time you've got training specifically for the event um, and being ambitious, take a mm. risk and um, take a chance. Um, don't, be, don't be scared to try something different um, and perhaps have a way of measuring your training so you can increase the demands on your training so you do make progress. So... Um, Try and be race specific. If you're going to have to run for 20 minutes, cycle for 35, 40 minutes and run for another 10, you need to reproduce that at, at race level mm -hmm. for the period that you need to be able to deliver it for. Um, and then I'd include transition training in that as well, obviously. And yeah. um, I think one piece of advice that I picked up on was don't waste a really hard bike without doing a short run off the end of it. 
Mm. As a duathlete, um, you should always chuck a little run on the end of a really hard bike. If you've done a hard mm. bike in your garage or whatever, go out and have a just run for five minutes at the yeah. end. Just get that, get your legs used to the shock of that transition, that second transition. Yeah, no, that's uh, that was brilliant advice. It really is because um, there isn't anything like running off a bike, especially a hard bike. Um, it's just your legs. I was having this conversation with one of the girls who's on the podcast next week and she's quite new to new to it as well. And, and she was at a Veals and got a silver medal in her age group. And she said, there's just absolutely nothing, nothing, no experience can uh, pre- pre- prepare you for that. Um, unless you, like you've just said, quite rightly train for it. Um, and then you, your legs get, get used to it. I mean, they never totally get used to it because it's always a bit strange, but yeah, definitely a great piece of I think it's not wasting the bike session by adding the short run on the end of it. Yeah. Um, Because that's what our race involves. Mm. It doesn't involve a gentle cool down. Um, It involves going from a hard bike straight out into maximise that second run. Yeah. Okay, what's what's your favourite piece of kit? Well, I'm not, I, I, I prefer things to be more functional than um, particularly brand led. So I enjoy getting on my Planet X time trial bike and it feels wonderful when spring comes around and the time trial bike comes out. Um, as, as a sprint distant athlete, the race is a draft legal. So I enjoy my, my road bike, my Ridley road bike for the draft legal races. Um, but I'm not sure I have a specific favourite piece of kit. Or I'd possibly say my GB vest, because I think right. it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful when you pull that vest or your suit on and it has your name on it. Um, I think that's a, a wonderful thing. So, yes, I'd probably say that. Yeah, cool. Fair enough. Don't think I've had that one before. So that's, that's a first. That's good. What resources do you use and would you recommend for people to help them out training or otherwise? I think if you if you have the opportunity to have a turbo trainer or some stationary bike, and I presume the vast majority of people involved at this level will have, but I also think a treadmill is really helpful if you've got the space. Yeah, um, They're often available secondhand because a lot of people need to move them on. Um, non-athletes tend to, um, the novelty wears off quite quickly, mm-hmm. so they're often available secondhand. And living in Yorkshire, it's a long winter and Mm. the opportunity to train indoors when it's icy outside. Um, And you can recreate your duathlon in your garage Mm. with those two pieces of kit. So I think it's quite a privileged position to have both those pieces of kit. But I think it really helps. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very lucky to have those. I've got to go to the gym, unfortunately, but that's all right. It's not that far away. (laughs) Uh, well, I train. I tend to train every morning before work and then on a weekend. But it's when it's so convenient, it helps you be more consistent because yeah. you've got it all set up as you want it, and you're straight straight into your garage and able to train straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's saving your time, isn't it? As well, it's saving your time, and you've got all the data there to show exactly what you are doing, so yeah. you can be quite specific and dialed in. And- on it. Yeah, and it's consistent, isn't it? Because you're using the same treadmill and the same bike. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's a, that's a good thing to be able to have. So what are your um, short and long-term goals then, James? Uh, short-term goal is to stay healthy. I've had a bit of a hamstring issue for about 40 weeks now, so doing a lot of prehab on that and rehab on that. So to maintain the body to function really well and... Um, from a duathlon perspective, just to keep qualifying as long as possible, surrounded by friends and sustain those friendships on the trips. Um, And I think when the duathlon uh, adventures come to an end from a GB perspective, to return to the final uh, marathon for the the series around the world um, and have a go at getting a Boston qualifying time and running Boston, that would complete the original five uh, major yeah. marathons around the world. Um, so come back to that. Yeah, excellent, excellent. When So what other things do you do, um, other than obviously biking and running, what other things do you do to keep yourself sort of like fit and healthy? And Well, um, I had spinal surgery about 30 years ago. 
Um, so that uh, I, I do back exercises about four times a day. Yeah. And uh, strength and conditioning, probably 10 minutes most days yeah, yeah. on the strength and conditioning. Um, and just fine tuning the diet, um, mm -hmm. making sure the diet's as healthy and as, as balanced as it can be um, without being obsessive about it in any way. Just being mindful of trying to have good quality foods. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I think, a quite a holistic, holistic view with reasonable amount of sleep, reasonable diet, reasonable, consistent training, and then step it up periodically to target the races um, and be proportionate around it, really. And that's yeah. helped me sustain it for over 30 years and yeah. still be going into my mid-50s at a decent level. Um, and to continue would be my goal. Um, there's so many wonderful opportunities to see the world through sport. Mm. And I've been to some amazing cities to do the marathons. Yeah, Athens, Istanbul, so Washington, Chicago, New York, Berlin. These are all wonderful places to go and to run through the streets and then to go out with GB teams and see some terrific places as well. Mm. Um, I think it's a great way to see the world as well as seeing your own country with the fell races and mountain races in rural areas so mm. just to keep going at all of it for as long as possible um yeah. is on one hand a very simple goal but on another hand it would be the most rewarding of experiences to continue it yeah well i think if you keep going like you're going um and looking after yourself like you are i think you shouldn't have any problems um you, you see you see the gb athletes at all ages don't you from you know from the young ones right the way up over 80 so I think, like you said, you, you're pretty much living the lifestyle anyway, aren't you? So it is a lifestyle for us all, and there isn't any reason that you can't keep going. No, that comes very naturally to me, the lifestyle. Um, mm. I, I have no... Um, it's not a sacrifice not to go out socialising or the rest of it. And this is a lifestyle that suits me, which is why uh, I've sustained it for over 30 years. I'm very... Yeah suited to this lifestyle yeah. um it's it, it fits very well cool well i think that's a great place to to land it um thank you ever so much again for your time it's been lovely to meet you have you got anything else that you'd like to add no that's fine um i think we're in the same age group i've seen your name down so i yeah. hope at some point we get to uh either race each other or certainly meet up i know you punctured at croft last year uh, unfortunately on the first, yeah. the first corner yeah. Uh, I was looking out for your name somewhere on the back of a tri suit to come and say hello. <laughs> um, but no, thank you for doing the podcast. And uh, I've enjoyed listening to other people's stories of, of their circumstances. And I think my overall message was um, for people to have a go at this and just enjoy the thrill of the journey. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful experience. And I think we'll all back on it with great fondness. Um, however it kind of comes to an end but it's provided some wonderful memories in the meantime yeah. um, and, and I think enjoying it with friends has really added to it the people that I've met mm. uh, and my good friend Ian that I've gone abroad with to race the GB with um, it's been lovely to have friends to share it with and share your training with and uh, um, I, th I think it's a great thing to do with our time yeah absolutely is totally agree with you 100% so yeah, yeah. Let's let's hope we can meet up at some point. Um, don't know when that's going to be. <laughs> no, so no. We have to wait, see. Have to wait and see. Uh, they haven't they haven't um, told us about the where the next races are going to be for the sprints, have they yet? So we're not we're not aware. No, um, I'll chuck a time in and see what happens, and yeah. uh, just just. Um, it, it, in a sense, I, I'm, I've been to both the Europeans and Worlds now. Anything else is a bonus. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and we'll just keep going as long as we can and see yeah. and see how the world turns out. There's other things at play here apart from ourselves, isn't there? It's a, there is. It's a complicated time. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see how it plays out. But yeah. Um, well done for doing the podcasts, and they're a great record of people's experience. So yeah. Um, I hope I'm you glad you've said that actually, because that's exactly how I feel about it. I think people can now actually individually take them and they're documented. So their kids and their grandkids and that's you know what I mean? It's like it's gonna be yeah. there in the ether forever. And I just think yeah. that's it's such a great thing for people to be able to have and to keep hold of. 
So yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, and uh, that that was one of the reasons uh, that uh, that I thought I'd uh, just get in touch. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah no, very good. All right, All right mate. Thanks, take you, care. Cheers. Cheers now. Bye bye. Well, thanks again, James, for um, taking the time out to get in touch and to come on the podcast. Great chatting. Um, Love the fact that you've been doing it for so long and you had all the information uh, from back in the day when it was all kicking off. Um, And you could tell us how it had changed. That was really, really interesting to find out what your, your thoughts on the changes and things over the years. Um, it's great to hear that your kids are involved as well and it's a family affair that was really nice um, and it's that sort of sport I think that if you've got the inclination it doesn't you don't have to be out there doing it on your own you can actually get your kids involved get your family involved it can just become a lifestyle like it has for James so so yeah well done good luck in the future uh, and I hope to see you at a race at some time um, when we'll have a catch up face to face Right, moving on to our lifestyle hack of the episode. And like I said earlier, this one's about dairy-free. And I've been dairy-free now for two and a half years, maybe a bit longer. I didn't look at the exact date. Um, And I just thought to myself one day after I'd been listening to a podcast, um, as you do, (laughs) and um, I just thought that I didn't really need it anymore. Um, I'd already cut cheese out and butter out because of having a heart attack seven years ago. That that had gone already, so it was literally um, milk that I was putting in on cereal and um, and coffee. Uh, and I think that was really all, and maybe in cooking occasionally, um, but that was really all uh, we would use it for. And after listening, like I said, to uh, a few podcasts and then doing a bit of research, um, it's a bit weird when you really drill down. This is how I felt about it. I felt it was a bit weird that we're brought up to believe that it's normal to drink milk. And if you really think about it, and this is this is where I'd got to, if you really think about it, Drinking another animal's milk that's supposed to be for their offspring is like it's a bit it's a bit strange, isn't it? Um, but it's it was normalised. That's what we did, and that's what loads of people, the majority, still do. But if you really think about, it, you're drinking another animal's milk that is supposed to be for their offspring, and that sort of didn't really sit well with me. And then when I looked into it, there was lots of other things that it wasn't good for. When you switch to dairy-free, um, you'll notice that you're not as bloated and you may even lose weight if that's if that's what you're after. To be honest, I didn't, um, I didn't really notice that myself uh, or the bloating. Um, and the other thing that it, it, it is claimed and these are all just claims. I don't think there's any um, research behind it. There may be. I haven't come across any. Um, that it can reduce congestion and your taste buds also change depending on um, what you're eating and drinking. So cutting out an overpowering uh, flavour of dairy uh, means you'll appreciate tastes more. Um, it says that it's linked with excessive mucus production so that'll help your sense of smell it's supposed to be linked to constipation so swapping it for a more fibrous alternative will make it easier for you to go (laughs) apparently it's supposed to be good for the skin again I haven't really noticed any change uh, on that I've got to be honest um and the bigger one for me was that switching to dairy free um food apparently um helps your energy levels soar because milk products are naturally high in amino acid tryptophan which promotes tiredness uh, 
And dairy is also harder to digest uh, other than other food, causing your body to use more energy. So when you cut back on that, you'll notice your increase of energy. Your body's not using that energy to help digest it. You've got more energy for everything else. So it contributes to your overall sense of well-being. And then added to that is um, reducing the exposure to added antibiotics and hormones that are given in mass quantities to dairy cows. Um, and this is supposed to help prevent infection. Um, but there's been a massive concern about the consumption of these antibiotics um, through the milk supply and, and antibiotic resistance. And also there's two sources of hormones that are said to be in the milk supply, which is the BGH, which is bovine growth hormone. Um, a natural occurring hormone in cows that stimulates the production of insulin, like growth factor, and a synthetic version, um, which is used in conventional dairy farming to help simulate milk production, which further increases the levels of insulin-like growth factors. So the consumption of cow's milk has been shown to increase the uh, level of IGF-1 in humans by about 10%. This has been linked to a significant increase in the risk of prostate, colon, lung and breast cancers. Um, so, again, this is all just what I've found out. Um, it didn't make good reading. There's always two arguments to the, to the story. Um, it's only my personal preference. So, I cut it out. I've got to say I feel a lot better for it. And don't regret it at all. So... That's it, yeah, just um, make your mind up, do a bit of your own research and find out if it's going to help you um, and if it'll make you feel better. Um, yeah, but uh, as, with, as with all these things, make your own mind up. That's just, that's just a little hack that added to all the others that I do, um, I thought it was worth sharing, so... And that's about it for this episode, so thank you ever so much for listening, and thanks for your support again. Much appreciated. If you want to get in touch, um, you can drop us an email at agegroupmultisportpodcast.gmail.com. You can find us on Instagram at am underscore 1967. You can DM us on there if you want. Send us a message. Um, you can find us on Facebook at ampgb. Again, same thing. You can... DM us, send us a message. Uh, all the episodes at website, um, which is agegroupmultisportpodcast.buzzsprout.com. We're also on YouTube at AmpGB. We have our Twitter account, which is agegroupmultisportpodcast. Um, and if you do like what you're hearing, um, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. Um, it helps us to... Uh, broaden our um, our profile and get other people listening so that's much appreciated rate review and uh, subscribe and that would be that would be fantastic and as always stay safe keep training and love the process <laughs> <laughs>